It's a real pleasure to welcome you to the third uh, Built Environment Impact Lecture of the Year. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on vegetable land today, uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to any First Nations peoples who are joining us um, today. So in this third lecture, um, I'd like to welcome three people who are going to be talking a little bit about um, their research. Firstly, Professor David Sanderson from the University of New Built Environment, Andrew Ray, and Joanne Morell. So without further ado, I will pass over, I believe, to David. Yes. Thank you all for being online and for joining us. Um, I'm going to ask um, if my two friends and colleagues can say who they are. Joe, can you tell us who you are, please? Hello, everyone. I'm Joe Morell from Butlow in New South Wales. Great, working with Anglica, I see. Good. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm Andrew Ray. Uh, I work with New South Wales Reconstruction Authority and have been involved in bushfire recovery uh, since the Black Summer fires of uh, 2019 20. Okay, great. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk about maybe we could see the presentation. Beautiful, thank you so much. Uh, and it's a rather Big title, How to Support Community Centre Disaster Recovery. Uh, can you go to, oh, I can do this, can't I? Let me go to that one. Okay, so we're going to talk about people and organisations. Um, the photo there is from some work in Tumba Rumba, where Andrew is from, and you got up at 5 a.m. this morning to be with us. I did. Thank you, Andrew, for coming all that way, uh, which is very nice. I'm moving around, but I was probably not going to help the camera very much. Okay, so we're going to talk about three things. Um, if you like, I'm the starters, and I'm going to talk about Community-centered recovery is easy to say and very hard to achieve. The main course, if you like, is Andrew and Joe talking about the 2019-20 bushfires in Estonia Valley. So we, of course, work with the council. Joe was working for that and there's a lot of expertise and experience, just acknowledge that. Then I'll end with a very short uh, dessert, if you like, about uh, the initiative we're kicking off relating to this. So three parts. Uh, we won't go longer than 35 minutes, something like that. And this is a very nice size. Okay. So let, let me kick it off and set the scene, if you like. So in post-disaster recovery of floods or earthquakes or whatever it is, the global gold standard, if you like, is that it's community-centered, that people are most affected are those who should determine what recovery is. And you'll find that all around the world. That's the, the thinking for decades. It's no surprise there. Uh, and, you know, it's in many things. Our government certainly thinks that. Um, some of the ingredients, when it works well, of course, it's local, it's place-based. People get a say, all those things. Not a surprise to anybody. There's trust, local power, voice. So easy to say, so hard to do. But things get in the way. Of course, it takes time and energy. People are busy with their lives to acknowledge there's trauma and people are affected and they've lost property. You know, there's nothing easy about this subject uh, in disasters all around the world, which as we know are getting more frequent and more intense for a variety of reasons, all these climate change. Uh, marginalized people are very often left out. Those who are allowed to dominate the conversations. I mean, there's plenty of evidence behind all these things, by the way, it's just not what I think. Uh, people are exhausted and burnt out. Of course they are. So it's easy to say and very hard to do is the picture I want to paint. And it's a global issue. And one of the issues relates to, and this is kind of the main theme of the, the, what we're talking about, really, that business as usual is that emergency services provide support, and we're very grateful. Thank you very much. But unwittingly, that can take away some of the agency of local groups. Not because anyone conspires to do that, but the systems themselves are problematic, and it's not just what I think. Uh, this report took five years, led by Neri Anderson around the world. She and her team interviewed about 5,000 people in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Europe, saying, what was your experience of those coming to help you after a disaster? That would be UN, NGOs, local government, others. And the main overwhelming statement was, thank you very much, of course, you've saved our lives, literally, done stuff, thank you, this is not a, a strong critique. But after that is, please listen to us. In your busyness, you don't listen very well. Uh, that's, I mean, I'm broad summaries, but that, that's really the message of this. So much so that Mary called this report Time to Listen. Time for agencies to listen. This came out 12 years ago. We've been doing our own survey for the last year and a half, uh, asking people across Australia, in fact, what were your experiences post disaster? <coughs> and a series of statements, please actually sign up and do this. We've had, a, it's about 150, 200 replied so far. Uh, it's a rolling survey which we intend to run over several years, in fact. And we put out a series of statements, and this is thanks also to our colleague Tim Heffernan, who's on the call right now. Uh, my voice was heard in the recovery. Now, I mean, watch out statistics. 
uh, about, you know, what, what's that, about 8% strongly agree, about a 30% agree. What I find interesting is, you know, over 60% probably could not find that they agreed that their voice was heard in the recovery. I, I mean, who knows why people were mutual. My, my guess is that people are very polite, actually. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to draw anything else. Two-thirds of people are just done that couldn't find themselves agreeing to that statement. Uh, another, I mean, we had about 20 things. I'm just going to share two or three. Community members were treated equally. Again, most people found they couldn't agree with that. And disasters are unfair. I, I know, I, I, I'm reading you. If they're unfair things, and that's a, a global thing. Uh, young people were involved. The vast majority disagree. And uh, our colleague Tim, who's the right honourable minister for everybody under 30, <laughs> our project, is working with an awful lot of people in, in the region in Snowy Valley. It's 18 to 25 year olds with a, a longer term engagement in this. Um, why is supporting community recovery so difficult? There are lots of reasons. I'm just summarising a few, okay? The bottom line is this top down, bottom up uh, contrast to do with power of inequality, the helpless victims, the saviour mentality, the helicopters that come in, which are needed and necessary. I'm not criticizing that. But after the immediacy of relief, there's a systemic issue when it comes to actually how we strengthen community-led recovery, community-centered. Agency key performance indicators, the pressure to spend, which is nice. It's very hard to spend money, actually. The pressure's on, and you might not get it right. Power imbalances. If you're from government, you're here to help, and you're going to talk to that in a minute, I know, Andrew. Um, product over process, timeframes, blah, blah, blah. An awful lot of issues, which I think Andrew and Joe are going to unpack. This is uh, Joe and I were actually at last year's um, uh, conference, and you probably can't read it. It was uh, in Adelaide. That center it says connecting communities, and it's a big, um, I looked at the way that stands for, but I forgot. But it's really. Fire, fire authority committee. Fire okay. authorities committee. Okay, great. Now, now, the theme of this conference was connecting communities, and some of us spoke, and it was great, and there were thousands of people. Uh, Joe, you might remember this, we both walked in here, and every single stand, of which there were about 90, are, are stands of our kit. That's not a criticism of kit, don't get me wrong. But if it's about connecting communities, and there's not a single stand about communities in there, and not a single community group, and I certainly have got facts of this quite seductive, actually. <laughs> it's quite, quite, quite cool stuff, you know, it's, it's the kit thing. Uh, and there is a famous phrase in the international humanitarian sector, which is where I'm from, that relief is the enemy of recovery. That if you keep people sustained in relief, recovery is very difficult to move on to. Relief is the enemy of recovery. And I think there is a valid argument here that we are sustaining relief in our recovery mechanisms. Okay, so I've just got three or four more slides. There's a lot of experience around the world. And this is the segue into the project that's brought us together. Uh, this project funded by Region New, New South Wales, and thank you very much. Just two approaches. One relates to what are called area-based approaches, and this has been around 15 years. It goes back in planning 40 years. There's nothing new in any respects. The diagram in the left is the global humanitarian aid system, where you organize, to summarize a big story, top-down centralized recovery of delivery. Again, you need that, but the risk is you don't take full account of community-centered. The shift on the right in the last 15 years is more what's called area-based approaches, local people scaling up. It's a support versus provide thing where agencies support, not provide. Easy to say, incredibly hard to do. But we did some research in this area, and as one person put it very clearly, a key informant, if there was an easy way, we would be doing it. All right, if you want to get it right, it takes time. It was you, right? Because you've been doing it for years. A second one is really the segue to the project we've been involved in, it's brought us together for the last two years, uh, relates to action planning. And this approach has been around a long time, again, from urban planning, 50, 60 years, from built environments, a quote from Nabil Hamdi here, action planning approach reverses the power. We're no longer the professionals in charge of tell people what to do. We literally reverse the process and listen and engage and catalyze and facilitate. It's community development. Okay, and it's based on serendipity, well, world's favorite word, um, problem-based, opportunity-driven, starting points, not end states, bottom up, all those things. It reverses the project process. And on another day, we can talk at length of that. Just two examples. One from India, this was some years ago, in this settlement in Delhi, which had been there about 30 years. And uh, we, with an NGO, a well-known NGO called Seeds India, and in fact, the Indian government, you know, they know Seeds India. Um, we, we started, this was their first ever project, 1995. And we were involved in doing community stuff, community workshops. There was an equal number of group of women on the other side, uh, just, just to say that. We did some assessments here, and this area flooded regularly, and it's a squatter settlement, people shouldn't be there, regular fires. And we did some surveys, and people said, which means listening, 
And people said, well, the number one issue is, is not pricing price. We get that, we know that. The number one issue is, at the top of that slope there, there's a six-lane highway, and the school is on the other side of the highway. So how do the kids get to school? And that was the number one issue, was traffic. We don't need a bus ride. We come in, we do a thing, or we go out for the rest. Of course, that's important. So the number one priority was, our kids need an education, so we have a better life. Okay, and then the second one before I'm going to hand over to you, Andrew, this was a long time ago, now you can see the date. Um, if in doubt, hold workshops, lots of workshops. We've been doing lots of workshops that you've been leading. And this was around, and this was makes quite a fair tingle actually. The people on the bottom left are market traders. No one has ever asked them their entire life what they think about their markets to do with earthquake and fire. No one's ever asked. You come in and you tell people. We got the, the local fire agencies there were there. Again, they no one asked them what they think. So you bring people together. Guess what? And you have a lot of fun and you engage. And out of this came many things over many, many years. In fact, the mayor of Lima got involved in the end of a whole bundle of things. But the starting point was what are we going to do? And then it grew out. So I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about what brings you here today. Thank you, David. And thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you about uh, a, uh, a topic that's very dear to my heart. A uh, little bit of background I'm a suit, I'm a blowing for Tamarumba in the beautiful Sally Valleys. Uh, a career suit, management background, uh, process re engineering. Moved to a, a country town and uh, joined the local council and found myself, after a few years in a strategic planning and engagement role, neck deep in disaster recovery. Um, it wasn't something that I was expecting. Uh, it really and truly has changed the trajectory of my whole career, and I couldn't think of a world where I don't uh, do this work in. Um, Snowy Valleys is at the foot of the Snowy Mountains. We are probably about five, uh, 500 kilometres from Sydney, 500 kilometres from Melbourne, about halfway. Uh, we're a rural and remote uh, area, a population of about 15,000. When I give these talks, um, I like to put into, to provide a bit of context. We've all heard bushfire stories. Um, we've all seen the news of, of the devastation that the fires caused during Black Summer. So I don't like to talk about that. That's deeply, deeply embedded in the back of my brain. But one thing I like to do is just add a bit of context around what our impact was in the Snowy Valleys. So we had 243 houses damaged or destroyed, 194 were destroyed. Um, we had 798 outbuildings, 460 of those 798 were destroyed. Outbuildings in, in parlance to rural living is machinery sheds, shearing sheds, uh, big pieces of, of infrastructure that sit on farms. And outbuilding sort of sounds like an outhouse, but to give you some context there, very expensive things to lose. 50 council assets, 4,293 square kilometres. That's 405,000 hectares of land and probably around 48% of our total shire burn out. You can see the uh, the rest of the, the statistics up on the screen there, but one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, uh, and it's a quirky little story that I like to tell, those 4,000 guideposts that had to be replaced, part of the uh, council requirements to get those funded under the disaster recovery funding arrangements was that each guidepost had to be photographed and a pin dropped on them on a GPS map. That was part of the process of getting the funding in. So. <laughs> the 350 kilometres of road reserve that cleaned up um, and public lands, that came at a cost of, uh, at last count, as of the end of my, um, April when the project finished, three years, three and a half years nearly after the fires, at a cost of about $20 million, just in that alone. So, as you can see, the, the impact to our area was quite significant. About 10% of the total impact to the total, to the whole state happened in the Snowy Valleys. So, as you know, we're a pretty big state, so that's a for a small area, massive impact. Uh, one of the things I didn't cover off there is our main industry is softwoods, pine, uh, structural timbers. In Tumbarumba alone, it's the major employer, plus all those peripheral edge and employment opportunities that come off that. The, the guys who drive the trucks, the guys who actually pull the timber out. Uh, it's a massive uh, industry. A lot of pine got burnt. Most of the mature pine, so 30 years worth of growing these trees, got burnt. Uh, the pine industry had six months to, to pull those trees out and get them processed before the timber wouldn't be structurally sound enough to use. So that in itself uh, created a lot of problems with a lot of resources coming into the area, a lot of big yellow machinery required, a lot of trucks to get around, completely devastated and destroyed our road network. The other thing a lot of people don't know is the cumulative impact of disasters. The Snowy Valley's LGA, local government area, is now up to its ninth disaster declaration since Black Summer. 
So floods, you get hit by floods. Add on top of that a pandemic. So we've been dealing with a lot. Once again, small community, uh, small size communities. Uh, where I live in Tumbarumba, we're a community of around 3,000 people. Uh, the biggest town being Shum, it's about 7,000. So we're spread out over the fire scar covered basically 250 kilometers across. So for me to drive from one end of the fire scar to the other, covers about 250 kilometers. My role with the Snowy Valleys Council uh, in disaster recovery, if it had bush or fire on it, it landed on my desk. They didn't necessarily need to be in the same word, in the same sentence, but it certainly landed on my desk. Um, very small council, very low on resources. But one of the things with the recovery work I was doing was the opportunity to build a recovery plan. And I got really excited by that, that uh, this is where we make a difference and do it at a grassroots level. Uh, and that was until uh, when the brief came out that this plan was going to be a very high level plan that would sit inside other emergency management plans and probably just gather dust and never be looked at. That was created a lot of frustration inside me because I knew where we were going to make a difference was at a, at a community based level. Um, the trauma associated with an event like Black Summer really can't be underestimated on the impact on the mental health and wellbeing of communities. Um, it's something to this day that uh, when you're talking to people about the, the event and they're still in recovery mode, rest assured, three and a half years on, still very much in recovery mode, you see that trauma come to the surface pretty quickly. I carried my own trauma from it. You know, I lived in this community as well and was part of that community. So uh, I spent many nights, uh, I'd go to sleep for a few hours and wake up one o'clock in the morning and be wide awake. And that was my, my day, I'd probably three hours sleep. I did that constantly for a period of about three or four months before I had to seek some help and find out what was going on, right? So, so the day, you can't underestimate that. Um, I want to um, talk a little bit about the Resilient Towns Initiative and, and that was born out of some frustration and, and a, I guess a serendipitous opportunity to meet my good friend over there, David Sanderson, um, who, who come to the Snowy Valleys uh, um, to help me do a bit of work and facilitating some workshops with our non-government agencies and, and government agencies on, on the next steps in recovery. This was about um, six to eight months after the fires we just come out of the first COVID lockdown, so we had this small window of opportunity, and David come up and spent a week with me. And it was at that time that I introduced him to the beautiful Joe Murrell, who's, who's with us today. Um, and it was a meeting where, I guess, the seeds of this project were, were sown. And it was, uh, I'll probably hand over to Joe to tell, her, tell you guys the story, and the story of Batlow, and, and a couple of things that happened whilst the town of Batlow was under siege by this fire, that created the seeds to, to be sown for the Resilient Towns Initiative. So if I can hand over to Jo. You're there, Jo. I'm here, thank you. <laughs> can everyone hear me okay? We can. That's great. <laughs> yeah, so Batlow, on the, on the lead up to our impact, we were all um, instructed to pretty much attend some town meetings at the local RSL club. Um, the only thing was that nobody informed the local RSL club. So everybody decided that that's where they would uh, gather um, with no, no further instruction given. The town was completely unprepared. Uh, so we all ended up at the RSL club. There was very limited staff availability as well. Um, no resources there, no, no Things given out to anybody. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Kylie, who was our um, chairman, she ended up asking for volunteers to come and help her at the RSL club. So, um, I, along with my husband, we went down and volunteered down there to help set up and get things going. And while we were there, um, Batlow was also known for its apple industry as well. A very large number of apples are grown in this area. So, we had a lot of itinerant workers who were staying and the majority of those itinerant workers do not speak English as their first language. Um, again, no plan was put in place to try and evacuate um, these residents as well. So while I was there, we had um, a couple of people come forward to us and ask how do they get out of town. So um, there was absolutely nothing in place for them. So I ended up trying to put a call out on Facebook um, asking how on earth do we get some itinerant workers out of town when there was nothing for them. So um, 
I got a, a text message from a local bus company. Then we had to try and get in touch with the area commanding people who were in charge of everything to try and organise that, then try and find somebody who could speak enough English to translate for them as well. And in the end, um, we ended up getting about 16 itinerant workers out of town. So it was a massive um, effort by a lot of people, but um, yeah, very highly underprepared for that situation, especially when, as a resident, you're heightened as it is and incredibly scared with what was happening from what they were telling us that was going to come our way. We could see the smoke, we could see flames in different areas and that sort of thing. So I was ready to go, but um, not having a plan in place was um, really quite confronting for us. Thank you, Jo. Um, so, Jo, the conversation with Jo, and, and God love Jo, she always downplays things. So I just want you to think about that for a moment and put yourself in those shoes of the residents of Batlow. So Batlow sits in a, a bit of a valley of the township. Um, for days, it was, it was basically uh, under attack by these fires, and there was one particular day where the residents of Batlow, by the emergency services, through no fault of the emergency services, uh, representatives there told them to seek shelter at the RSL farm. Fantastic idea, big open area, big space, air conditioned, plenty of room. One problem, in the middle of the night when 400 residents descended on the RSL pub, it wasn't open, it was in darkness. How would you feel? The vulnerability in Batlow to this day is really raw over that very moment. There was another thing when the press um, and the emergency services referred to them as being undefendable. And it was probably about 18 months ago when I had a community group there, about 20 representatives in the community, and I, it always bothered me what this undefendable, because some people in Batlow wore that as a badge of honour. And I, I didn't really understand it, you know, what, what feeling that would, would give you to be told you're undefendable, and what that meant to them. And that one question I posed that day brought out all this emotion about what that felt to them. Some of them did wear it as a badge of honour and said, yeah, screw it, we defended them. We kicked that fire's ass. Others spoke about being left alone, being left for dead, we were abandoned. We had nowhere to go, we had no idea what we were gonna do. And that, that it was so such a raw conversation that gives me chills talking about it today. So that really got me thinking about, um, prior to that, when Joe relayed that story about that low and, and turning up at the RSL club, about how we're gonna, how we're gonna deal with this as communities, how are we gonna set communities up for success and take away that vulnerability at that moment in time where they're told to do something. And I firmly believe that it comes down to a few simple things. And one is, it's the way our emergency services deliver the messaging. And the other thing is, it's the way the communities understand that messaging. So if we've got the emergency services speaking French, we've got our communities listening in Spanish, we all need to be speaking English and do it in a way, in a manner that the community understand. We don't need the community control type uh, relationship. David and I, after that meeting with Joe, took the drive back to Tumbarumba and the, uh, we started just spitballing ideas. And uh, we come up with an idea that we needed to work with the community and go down to a grass level of the community and see what they wanted and see how they wanted to be engaged with and, and what was important to them. What they thought in their community was, was needed to make it safe again. So that's where the Resilient Towns Initiative uh, was born. And I want to talk about the word resilience for one moment. People who know me know I just can't stand the word. It is the most overused, overrated word that is going about ever since the Black Sun fires. And uh, resilience, you can't measure it. It's like an intangible, right? The one thing, the, the most resilient act you'll ever see is a, is a mum who takes a newborn child home for the first time and has to get up at three o'clock in the morning to tend to that child without really having experienced that before. That's resilience. You don't, you know, you, you, we've been through nine disasters since Black Summer. At what point and what time have we had the opportunity to refill our resilience levels? Because do you call on your resilience in times of disaster? Well, we've had no time to build that resilience. If you want to call resilience, if you want to use the parlance of the petrol tank, when do we have the time to do that? Because one after the other after the other was dealing with drought. So we don't get to do that. But there's one thing we can do. We can go into communities and we can listen to them. And a really good example of that was when the fires hit and I was charged with being the community recovery officer for Snowy Valley's Council, a job I love. And I had my little toolkit and it was chock-a-block full of all the information I could help people with. 
and I went to a little town called Orney, which is down at the southern end of the, the Snowy Valleys, that was blocked off for two weeks. People couldn't get in or out. We were, we were delivering basically ute loads of boxes of food down to these people and driving through flame impacted areas to get there. And it was our, our beautiful father, Father Branchick, and one of my colleagues at Council, Christine Cameron, who did that day in and day out just to get food down there, risking their own lives to get food down to these people. So anyway, when it was safe to go down, I went down with my trusty toolkit. I was going to tell them what I was going to be able to do for them. And for the next two and a half hours, they beat the shit out of me. See, Orney had one asset, and it was a, an old school hall that was built, built in about 1900. And I don't know if you've ever seen them, it was just basically one room, a wooden room, hot as Hades. But that space is where that community come to celebrate occasions. It's where they come and met. That was their safe space. It was where they mourned when someone died in their community. We're talking to a community about 16 families, but generational farmers, tough bastards. They beat the hell out of them. Two and a half hours. All they wanted to do was talk about that hall. We want to rebuild the hall. We need a hall back. But I can give you this money. I've got all these things in my toolkit that I can offer you. Not interested. So I sat back and I listened. And it was a valuable lesson for me in the, in the work I do now, is to use these and not this. So that was the basis of the Resilient Towns Initiative. What was our plan to go in? David speaks about serendipity. For a guy from a strategic planning background, didn't cut the mustard in me, I never planned. I need to know outcomes. I need to be able to measure this stuff. So <clears throat> for the first few months, and probably haven't helped us that COVID interfered with us going straight into the, into the community and undertaking these workshops, because I wasn't a believer, I must admit. My role was to stand up in front of communities and say, hey, we're here to listen to you. Don't ask me what the plan is, because I've got no bloody idea. But <clears throat> along that journey, I had a light bulb moment where we need to take a serendipitous approach to this work because there's no other way we can allow the community the space and, their, and the respect of their voices to be heard unless we don't go in with a plan, because it's their plan. It's not our plan. It's got nothing to do with us. It's what's important to them. So we asked the two questions at the first workshop. One was, how do you make your community safer? And the other one was, what was important to them? And that took us on a journey that's brought us to today over the last probably two years, I guess, David. Um, we've undertaken workshops in now six towns. We started with four or five on our, on our radar. Communities actually come to us and want us to come in and do that work. And it's a series of four workshops where we take them through a little bit of aspirational view of their communities. We try to keep them away from the bright, sparkly stuff because uh, one thing after disasters, governments are very good at throwing money, throwing money into communities. Um, it's a grant frenzy, it's a feeding frenzy of money being thrown into communities. After I left the council, I went and worked with the federal government for a while. The federal government's where 50% of the funding comes from. And I was at a meeting there last year, and the question was asked is, you know, how they can better utilise that money. And I said, just stop and allow people to breathe for a moment. Think about going in and sitting down with these communities and working with them on what their priorities are, instead of just throwing money and hoping that it sticks. Because what happens is communities start getting dazzled by the bright, sparkly stuff. We're going to have string, swing sets for all. We're going to have beautiful rock gardens. We're going to have multiple parklands with beautiful big string and trees. For a community of about 700 people, a bit of overkill. But what we can do is we can provide safe spaces for the community. So going back to the Battle of RSL example, is the RSL Club the best place you want to do your, your safe space? There's a few challenges that come to mind straight away with that. If people are of a certain faith, they may not feel comfortable going into a licensed premises. If you have a recovering uh, alcohol, uh, alcoholic or a recovering gambler, a recovering gambler, is a RSL club the best space for it? Did you ask the community if that was their, their safe space? We asked that question at Battle, like they come up with two other places that they could think of that may be better suited. And then we explored the pros and cons of those places and what they would need to build them up to be a better standard of a place to seek shelter. These aren't evacuation centres, we don't need massive beds or anything, you just need a place where people can go and take some shelter until it's safe to travel on and get out of there. So all these questions that we asked and over a series of four workshops, the last workshop is where the rubber hits the road and the absolute essence of the Resilient Towns initiative is to pose the question to the community and that one question that I like answered, who's going to turn the lights on in the hall? It's as simple as that. 
who's going to turn the lights on in the hall and open up the hall, put the kettle on to make sure we've got that safe space to address the vulnerabilities within communities and take that feeling away from them. And I know it sounds pretty silly and pretty simple, but that's what it comes down to. There's a lot of other issues. You know, disaster recovery, one of the things <coughs> I've learned over the last three and a half years, it's bloody hard. It's complex. It's different wherever you go. We're seeing the um, disasters uh, of Black Summer leading straight into the flooding events in the North Coast. Um, the displacement of people, um, our vulnerable communities, our most vulnerable in the communities, are the most affected by these disasters. Dave and I are having a conversation in the car coming down about the um, horrific displacement of communities up the North Coast. And this is a slow burn. The expectation of communities that we're going to go in there and wipe away the problem in 12 months is unrealistic. We're talking potentially, in my honest opinion, a generation before we see the effects of the North Coast flooding um, be overcome. We've got people now living in, in temporary housing. Uh, housing is always going to be an issue. Once again, government are copying it in the neck from the general public about their attention on, gen gen on temporary housing. But what do you do? Where do you place this? Where do you place over a thousand displaced people in communities where housing is already an issue? In rural and regional Australia, housing is an issue in, in metropolitan Sydney at the moment, I'm sure. So these, these challenges and these questions we ask constantly are very difficult to answer. But the one thing, and it's due to political will, it's due to a lot of reasons, that we don't take our time. We don't take that moment to provide initial relief and then think about what we're going to do in recovery and how that looks in different places. So I ask you this, that for those who are here today and haven't experienced their own disasters, when you see the frustration and you see the media about what the governments aren't doing, just think for a moment that what I told you today is just, to, we want to sit back and we want to take a moment to think about it because it is complex, it's multifaceted. We talk about recovery in the, in the four domains, social, built, environmental and economic. And today I've touched on a few of those with you, but um, I guess that's where I can leave it. Joe, have you got anything to add at all? I think the, the issue of the COVID pandemic also that halted a lot of our progress within our communities as well, like we weren't able to get out and mingle with our communities or have our communities come and gather together. So a lot of our farmers ended up staring down those endless, endless um, fence lines that were, you know, completely destroyed. They had no stock, the impacts of that on them, the impacts of not being able to have the um, itinerant workers come back again as well and do that apple picking. Some were already still um, stranded in Australia, so that was quite another issue. And then it, it does, it is that trauma fatigue, the community fatigue, overwork shopping, um, and yeah, just communities that they didn't know where to really start. So it was um, a long process turning up at, um, you know, farm gates with your own chair, your own thermos of hot water, your own tea bag, your own coffee. Um, and a packet of biscuits to share because they had absolutely nothing. So um, they're, they're key vital moments to be able to spend with those residents and listening to what they need, not um, what what government or what other agencies want to throw at them. It's, yeah, it, it might have been just, you know, on occasion I, I remember sitting down and I would say, if there was one thing in your shed you would like to replace today, what would it be? And, you know, somebody said a ladder. Somebody said, a, you know, a pair of gum boots, and somebody said a wheelbarrow. So that's again going back and just asking them what they needed rather than what they, what we thought they might have needed. Thanks, Jack. And one other point to that too is, we did see good recovery. Did it's not all bad storage, right? I live in the most amazing part of the world where communities gather together and ad hoc is what this stuff done. Beautiful community called Gingelic, which is uh, once again a border town. It just made it happen. Yeah, you know, they were the poster boys for recovery. They were an engaged community, they were a tight knit community, they had some smart people in there that'd be able to access funding and deal with all levels of government in a really respectful way that really um, got them their support and assistance in there early. Um, so this isn't a sad story. This is a this is a real story about recovery and what it looks like. And and Joe touched on a few things there. Yeah, you know, we had people rebuild their houses, but you know. I remember we, we had a, a, an event called uh, A Nine on the Couch where I, 
I, along with four residents in the Snowy Valley, who, who lost a lot or who helped fight the fires, all got up in front of the community to talk about our own journey through it. And it was more to shine a light on the mental health stuff, right? Because you know, if we aren't admitting to ourselves that we were, weren't impacted and affected by this mentally, then are we really helping each other? And, and in areas like ours, we don't have access to those services. So if I want to make an appointment with a, a mental health service provider, I've got to drive 150 kilometres and probably wait five weeks for an appointment. Um, if you're having evil thoughts, way too long to wait. We just can't walk out the front and get great service on our phones. I was here today getting 5G, I didn't know what it was. I can drive five minutes down the road at home and lose connectivity for an hour. During the fires, the number one issue coming out of the Virginia town stuff, communications connectivity. What Joe touched on about the social um, impact of the fires, it's really important and it's, and it's um, I ask you all if you get the opportunity to Google uh, some YouTube videos from Dr. Rob Gordon, who's a, uh, a specialist, um, psychologist who, who specialises in disaster recovery. He talks about social fracturing and cleavaging after disasters and the importance of getting communities back together. We lost that. Yeah, we were four weeks into formal recovery initiatives where we were, we were providing spaces for people to come and get the support they needed. We had to shut them down because COVID hit. So then all of a sudden, we've got traumatised community members out on farms, walking up and down the, the, um, the fence line, fixing it without any support around them. And it was, it was just harrowing. It was just really challenging. One of the benefits of COVID, though, was it, it delayed our project. Because we were ready to go into this project mode and get into these communities. But upon reflection, our communities weren't ready to have these conversations. They were fixing shit. They were busy doing stuff. They didn't need academics and blokes like me standing up in front of them and telling them how we could help them and, let, and gathering them in workshops and doing kumbaya sessions. I had some very dear friends that rebuilt a house um, and the, they haven't been able to put a picture up on the wall yet. Because, yeah, they, they got a new house, that's fine, but it's not their home. It wasn't their choice to rebuild. Another complexity of it. So people who actually were in a position to rebuild and get on with their lives aren't comfortable in their new life. I want their old life back. So it wasn't just, you know, the physical loss of the house. It took their heart. It took their soul. So... Yeah, it is challenging. I keep saying it. I've probably banged on way too long. David, please come back up and join me because I, yeah, I'm now just rattling. So, Great. but uh, yeah, thanks for listening to our story, and um, I'm going to hand over to David now to talk about a few of the issues coming up. Well, no, I, it feels better to stop now because if we put the screen back on, we lose you. We lose you. Uh, yeah. We started a bit late, so we're sort of mindful of time. So I think it feels like a good place to stop. So the, 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 the very aware we we, we talk project. Project is just a bit of like it's a slice of. Print. Day one, it was what's, what's the investment of this very small thing into long-term recovery. So we linked with Joe straight off in Anglicare and Red Cross as well, Snowy Valley's Council, Nima, who you were with, you know, and said, you know, this is all about starting points, not end states. There's no fixing it in two years. All right, so, so we're, we were very aware of that. It was investments rather than stuff we were talking yeah. about, that real-life stuff. But it feels right to stop there. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for people online. Joe, don't go, will you? But... Uh, Thank you for everything you said. Great, over to, what are we doing? Are we doing a Q&A? Uh, questions? Questions, I think. If anybody has any questions, we can leave the section. Eva, please. Thank you, thank you so much for um, the generosity in sharing your stories. Um, I had a question, I think David, well, one of the slides, there was a blue band that said, um, how do we make sure marginalised voices are heard? And, and kind of work with the issue of the loud the loud voices always being heard. Being heard. How did you deal with that in some of the workshops that, that you were running? And I get it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but I'm interested in your strategies to yeah. make sure that um, a diversity of voices are brought to the table when oftentimes, you know, you're moving really quickly. Yeah, I, um, do you want me there to, do you mind if I see that? No, I've, I've, I've got a loud voice. Um, one of the things that David and I spoke about, and I'm, I want to, I want to apologise for my crassness. It's just me. But I remember saying to David when we, we were, I guess, sort of spitballing this idea that if I never have to engage with a seventy-year-old white person again, I'll die a happy man. Because I live in a very white and ageing community, and I've engaged with this community for the better part of the last five and a half, six years on various things. Council issues on rates, roads, and rubbish right through to bushfire recovery. 
And they're the squeaky wheel, right? They're the voices. So what we did is we actually targeted some communities where I, we, I knew that our First Nations um, peoples were. So a place called Brungle, um, which was a, initially was an Aboriginal um, land settlement. Um, and a, um, and our, our Indigenous history in our whole area sort of comes out of, of Brungle, right? So we chose that as one of the areas that we wanted to work with. Then we, there was Ian Towns initiative and Tim Heffernan, who is our all thing. Tim's the youngest dude, right? We're all middle-aged white men, the people I didn't want to engage with, who I just happened to work with. Um, and women, sorry, Joe. Um, the, the fact was that Tim was the youngest guy in our, um, in our team. There's no point me coming up with an engagement strategy for young people and youth because I'm not young anymore. And uh, so we, we decided that we wanted their voices in the room too, but we provided their own space to do that. So one of the things that come out of the, um, the fires down in Tawang, which is a Tawang Shire facing Corrie on Lamp, Snow River country, which is our border community on, on the Victorian side. Um, some interesting feedback from their youth was that when they were brought into a recovery committee environment with all the people, they felt ground out. So what Tawang did was provide them their own space, right? And then all of a sudden they're coming up with these great ideas and initiatives and thinking about um, preparedness and, and all that stuff that we wanted them to think about. So we've provided their own space for that and then tapped into Anglicare's um, Starting Fresh program in Batla, things like that. So we've been really aware, has it been success, successful? One of the things we found in Brungle was, um, and I've found this out very, very late due to my relationship with one of the elders out there, was that the Indigenous First Nations people of Brungle want to do this stuff on their own, not with the whole community. And I'm okay with that. Very, very difficult for me being, you know, um, not being Indigenous and, and um, but I was respectful enough to go in and talk with the elders about how they want to do it. So we'll do that after the, the, the program shuts down. We'll, you know, I'm still going to be in the space. Joe's going to be there. Our beautiful friend Kate, we haven't probably paid Kate enough mm -hmm. uh, respect today. Red Cross, I want to talk about, to you about Red Cross for a minute. Um, I will never hear a bad word about Red Cross. They copped it in the neck after the fires. And it was from ill-informed people who didn't know what they were talking about. So Red Cross, um, on average, provided over $60,000 in cash to people who lost their homes, right? all across the fire scale of Black Summer. What do you think would have happened if those Red Cross gave $60,000 to someone five minutes after they lost their house. Do you think they're at their best time to be making wise choices with money? So what they did, they drifted that money out. They got twenty or 30000 up front and then a few more payments along the way. Um, they took their time. Funny that, what I've been saying for the last hour. Take your time. So for people who want to can Red Cross and say that the money didn't get to the people, yes, it did get to the people and they did exactly the right thing with it. Red Cross won't go out and blow their own trumpet because they're an NGO and they're quite humble in what they do. Um, so they won't go out there and shout from the rooftops the work they did. Our recovery would have looked a lot different and a lot worse without the Red Cross involved in it because it wasn't just the money side of it. It was those beautiful volunteers that followed me around for weeks on end, making sure that they were concierging our community and just providing a hug and rubbing arms around our community when we were trying to recover. So, round up. Great question, uh, I think there's a question, there's in, a question the in the chat to David and Andrew. Yes, I have a question. About um, Promega. Oh, okay, you're. Do you want to read it? Yes, please. Read it out, Tim. Yes. Um, it says, terribly boring question for Andrew. Apologies. When you are engaging with community and stepping through developing action plans, etc., for future disasters, how can you ensure that the delivery partners, be federal, state, local government, NGOs, are not putting themselves at risk of future for being held accountable if the strategies or approaches backfire? Yeah, yeah. so that's a, that's a really good question. Thank you, Megan. Um, a big part of when we were developing the program and some of the, um, we're recovery dudes, right? We're not firefighters, we're not first responders. We're probably the least first responders you'll ever know. Um, but one of the things we realised really, really quickly, if we're going to start talking about safe spaces, if we're going to start talking about what communities wanted to do, that we had to do it in conjunction with the, the emergency services. Because at the end of the day, when a disaster hits, 
it's the it's the fire brigade, it's the police, it's the um, SES that are the lead agencies in response. Okay, so when when it's getting real, they're the guys who lead the way. So they need to be in the in the um, in the conversation. So we've made sure that right along when we're developing a plan and developing these um, ideas with communities that the they're doing it in conjunction with the existing plans and in conjunction with the local authorities who will be uh, okay with that. So a perfect example of that is the Batlow example where um, you know, the community basically now said that you know, they don't want the RSL club. With all due respect to the RSL club, you know, um, there's challenges around a licensed premises. There's challenges around just staffing requirements for that sort of stuff. So they've got a really good hall there, but that hall needs a bit of work. We need to you know, get alternative source of power, we need other things. They've got the showground, beautiful big open area, but there's no real shelter at the showground for, you know, if it was a storm event. We, we're not, you know, we're talking bushfires here, but we're susceptible to um, to all different um, natural hazards. Or I shouldn't say natural hazards, not natural anyway. Um, so flooding is a big thing in our area. Uh, we get snowfall. Um, we have massive big log trucks that drive all around our area and, you know, Thousands of them each month that could roll over and explode. We've got, you know, there's lots of things. The biggest, um, uh, the biggest risk to New South Wales at the moment is heat waves. The biggest killer is heat waves. We don't talk about heat waves as a disaster, though, do we? But it's true. So, so we are working, Megan. Yes, we are working very closely. Um, we make sure that um, no one's really, no agency is doing prepared as well. In fact, the Virginia Towns guys, Kate, Joe, and myself, started looking for a template. Prepared us plan a template for the Australian market, we couldn't find one. So we had to develop our own. So we've developed our, our own template for preparedness plans that will be tailor made for communities. There may be other questions. another one in the chat from Scott. Um, as an RFS volunteer and quickly to Cabago to help family dairy farmers there, communications is a major black hole when phone towers are down, burnt or the backup generator fuel runs out, five days with only ABC radio and no way of knowing if all in soot was going to become embers. Has there been any plan with critical communications the general public when phone fails. Can I, can I, have I got time to tell you a story? Do you want, do you want another story? Um, we have a, a community that we're dealing with. It's, it's called the Elliott Way. The Elliott Way is a major thoroughfare from uh, Tumbarumba, through Kosciuszko National Park and over to um, to Cooma and the Snowy Monero. Um, <clears throat> on a good day out there, communication is terrible. Phone connectivity is horrible. So when the fires hit, obviously, as I said, number one, number our hip road was connectivity and communication. As a community, as part of the Virginia Towns Initiative, they decided that every one of those um, properties out there needed a two-way radio. As simple as a two-way radio. So then they, they sourced some funding for that, and every house out there now, from an idea that come out of them spitballing ideas as part of the Virginia Towns work, has got a two-way uh, radio on their property. And they've, they've actually um, brought people in to educate them on how to use them. And they do testing sessions every fortnight on a Sunday. They all know the channel they've got to get on and they can communicate as a community. We live in an area, and it's a conversation I have a lot. Um, we have connectivity issues on a good day. I told you before, I can drive 15 minutes out of town and lose connection for an hour. But we live in a beautiful part of the world, right? So that's a bit of a trade-off. If I want to live where I live, then things aren't going to be perfect. Uh, I've done a lot of work with Telstra over the last three years and, and we can have, they tell me that we can have a phone tower on every hill in, uh, in the Snowy Valleys area and still not everyone will have connectivity. So it is a challenge. We need to be better at it, I know that, but there's no, there's, there's no silver bullet for it. So, you know, it's one of the things we need to appreciate and have a redundancy plan, a two-way radio, something as simple as that. So do we have any other questions? Great. Well, in that case, thank you very much, Emily. Thank you, thank very, you. very much for doing that.
Uh, and thank you, Andrew. And as I say, you got up extremely early to be here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Jack.